if I coach myself, I would always think like more is better, more is better. And I think that's a, a bad mentality to get into. I think it's really good to see the bigger picture, to see that you need recovery days. You know, I think we all think, oh, I can be better every single day. And I, I think we've been, been taught that a little bit, that improvement happens on a daily basis and it doesn't, you know, you actually improve with rest. And for me, I'm not looking at the day-to-day -day improvement, but the week-to-week -week and then month-to-month. -month, and that's the key, I think, to me being 100% and healthy, which is what I need to perform at the highest level. Not everyone's going to always support you 100%. And as long as you are doing you and you know that you're becoming a, a better person, then that's what's important. That's Gwen Jorgensen. And this is The Rich Roll Podcast. The Rich Roll Podcast. Hey, everybody. How you guys doing? What's happening? Welcome to the show, to the podcast, to my podcast. Really quick, up top, reminder, my first live show. It's happening September 27th, Friday night at the historic, the gorgeous 1100-seat Wilshire Ebell Theater here in Los Angeles. It is shaping up to be quite a night to remember. Super excited about it. To get tickets and more information, click on the Appearances tab on my website, richroll.com. Also, uh, the link is pinned to the top of my Twitter page, at richroll. Second, if you're struggling with your plate, with your diet, if you're looking for a little extra guidance, please check out my Plant Power Meal Planner. It's affordably priced. It's just $1.90 a week. And when you sign up, you get access to thousands of nutritious and delicious plant-based recipes. We're always updating them. Everything is customized based on your personal preferences. It automatically generates grocery lists. It integrates with grocery delivery in most metropolitan areas. And you get access to an incredible team of experienced nutrition coaches seven days a week to answer all your questions. It really is a great product. So to learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. Okay. Today, my guest is 2016 triathlon Olympic gold medalist turned Olympic marathon hopeful Gwen Jorgensen. And what's really interesting about Gwen and her story is this relationship, this tricky, complicated relationship that she has with risk or perhaps a better way to put it is this tension that exists inside of her between risk and certainty. And it's a career theme that I think reveals itself over the course of our conversation. A conversation that begins talking about Gwen's career as a swimmer, where she competed at the University of Wisconsin as a walk-on, before making the switch to track and field and maturing into an NC2A standout and a Big Ten champion. But when Gwen's college career ended, so did her athletic ambitions, it would seem. Uh, she declines an opportunity to pursue a professional running career and instead joins Ernst & Young as a young CPA. So this is the certainty aspect of her personality and character. And that might have been that in terms of her athletic career had USA Triathlon not ended up relentlessly pursuing her <laughs> to get into this sport, uh, ultimately cajoling her into giving it a try. And that was a try that less than two years later landed Gwen on the 2012 Olympic team, uh, followed by dominating the sport for years and culminating in a gold medal in Rio. And then at the peak of her triathlon career with a cadre of lucrative sponsors and opportunities on the horizon, Gwen does the unthinkable. She decides to walk away from the sport altogether. So here's the risk part of her personality. And she does this on the very bold proclamation that her next goal would be quite an audacious one. It would be Olympic victory, not in swim, bike, run, but in the marathon. Now, not only was this a brand new discipline for Gwen, but consider this. No American woman has won the Olympic marathon since Joan Benoit did it in 1984, the first year that the women's marathon was introduced to the Olympics. So basically what we have here is the evolution of a conservative accountant into this killer, this risk-taking, unbreakable champion 
with the confidence to risk everything to follow her heart. And I think that's a very rare and amazing thing. Uh, Got a few more things I want to say about Gwen before we launch into it. But first, can I share an email with you guys? Is that okay? Can I do that? I think I'm going to do that. It's a powerful one uh, from a listener. Her name is Amy, and she writes, Hey, Rich, I started listening to your podcast about 12 to 18 months ago after my husband discovered your website and book. We had been eating a plant-based but not entirely vegan lifestyle for five or six years at that point, somewhat inspired by our move to Oregon and the sheer bounty of fresh fruits and vegetables that made it so easy. As a physician's assistant, I had heard about How Not to Die, which is a book by Dr. Michael Greger from one of the physicians that I work with at Kaiser Permanente and was getting more and more on board with it. But my husband was somewhat weighed down by the scientific nature of that book, which is exactly what I loved. He found someone speaking his language in your books and podcasts. I decided to check you out given his excitement and was hooked by your podcasts. They always leave me with a spark lit and a desire to do good either for myself, my family, my community, or my planet. I began to think about how to help my older brother. My brother had struggled with alcoholism and then due to the damage done to his pancreas developed diabetes several years ago. He lived on the East Coast And while we weren't in close communication, I felt if I just kept shining my light of seeing how healthy and happy I was, he would be inspired to start fully embracing a healthier lifestyle. We had started having some conversations, really just comments, that made me think he might be starting to listen to some of these ideas. And then last September, he died of a fentanyl overdose. No one in our family even knew he was using heroin. And it was at this point that your podcast became part of my grief journey. I found such insight in the redemption stories you often tell through your guests. I've come to understand my brother's struggle with addiction more, although I admit I may never understand it completely. While I don't consider myself to have any issues with alcohol, it has been a habitual part of my life as that was the environment I was raised in. How can you celebrate a birthday or holiday without it? Well, now I have started my one-year no-beer journey just for the sake of being more to my husband, kids, patients, and community. I left my position at Kaiser Permanente two years ago and am now at a private gastroenterology clinic and deal daily with alcoholics with cirrhosis and drug addicts with hepatitis C. I really feel your podcast has helped me to give them grace and compassion and help to resolve some of my judgment. So thank you. I look forward to more episodes. I often listen to them during long runs, and it is hard to run and cry simultaneously, but I look forward to it. I know it is helping me to continue on this journey of grief and understanding. So thank you, Amy, for being open and honest and vulnerable. Um, Sorry about your brother. I can't imagine the amount of pain and grief that you had to endure as a result of that. And that is addiction in a nutshell. Unfortunately, it is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And I'm just grateful that I've been able to provide a little bit of comfort and benefit as you undergo this and just appreciate you listening and sharing your experience with us today. So thank you. And again, just a reminder of the why behind what I do. It really is all about that. So thank you. All right. So we got to do a little business. And today's episode is brought to you by Grove Collaborative. So we all want to keep harmful chemicals out of our home. But with hundreds of different brands and products, navigating this world of eco-friendly goods can be really tough and confusing. But Grove Collaborative is here to take the guesswork out of going green. They've extensively scavenged the market and curate only the highest quality, natural, non-toxic, sustainably sourced items in their online store. And what's even better, they deliver these all-natural home beauty and personal care products directly to you. Every Grove.co product is guaranteed to be good for you, your family, your home, and the planet. So you can save time reading confusing labels and stop obsessively researching chemicals and additives in your cleaning products. Here's the thing. I always want to buy the most sustainable product that also actually works. And the difficulty with this is you do end up having to do all this research and then you find out that one product's at one store, but then you got to drive across town to go to this other store to get the other thing. And it just makes the process of trying to be sustainable 
unsustainable, which doesn't work in the long run, right? So what I like about Grove Collaborative is their entire marketplace is thoughtfully curated. And I trust the brands they carry. A lot of them I know, but even ones that I don't know, I trust that they're sourcing the best stuff. Everything that we have ordered from this company was delivered together in one convenient package. So there's no extraneous boxes or plastic bags, and I really appreciate that. So make the switch to sustainable goods and join me and over a half a million families who trust Grove Collaborative to make their homes healthier and friendlier to the planet. Plus, shipping is fast and free on your first order, so you can knock out your house cleaning chores ASAP. For a limited time, when my listeners go to grove.co slash richroll, you will get a free five-piece cleaning set from Mrs. Meyer and Grove, which has a $30 value. Go to grove.co slash richroll to get this exclusive offer. Grove.co slash richroll. Today's episode is also brought to you by Quip. I hate to break it to you, but summer is coming to a fast close next month, which means it's time to get back into your routine, and there's no better routine to fall into than one with Quip. Look, we're all adults here, and the truth is, let's be honest, it is easy to forget to brush your teeth on a regular basis, but Quip simplifies the whole process by helping you cover the basics. Timed sonic vibrations ensure you brush your teeth for two minutes, which is something 90% of the people don't do. And 30-second pulses remind you when to switch sides so you can clean your whole mouth evenly. Quip's mirror mount puts brushing front and center in your bathroom so you'll never forget to clean your teeth in the morning or before you go to bed at night. I've had a Quip toothbrush for a couple years now, and I think my favorite thing about it is the lightweight, compact design. I just had no idea that a toothbrush could be sleek and look so cool. I'm just super impressed with the look and the handle and the feel. Plus, it lasts three months on a single charge, which is amazing. And it just makes it easy to travel with and go off the grid with. You don't have to worry about a big bulky charger or wires or any of that kind of stuff. Another perk, brush heads are delivered on a dentist recommended schedule every three months for just five bucks. And that's great as a friendly reminder when it's time for a refresh and to stay committed to your oral health. And those are just a few of the many reasons why I appreciate my Quip toothbrush, and I think you will too. So get back into your routine and take care of your health this month. Quip starts at just 25 bucks, and if you go to getquip.com forward slash richroll, you can get your first refill pack for free. That's your first refill pack for free at getquip.com slash richroll. And finally, today's episode is brought to you by Jaybird, my friends at Jaybird. For me, peak living boils down to one simple thing, quality time spent exploring untouched nature with high vibe humans. And this podcast with Gwen that you're going to hear in a couple minutes came about by way of one such experience. It was an experience that was produced and hosted by Jaybird who are the people behind the best cutting-edge audio products for athletes in the active. And these guys invited me, they invited Julie, and about 20, 25 others up to Glacier National Park in Montana a couple weeks ago. And the official occasion was to celebrate the release of their new Vista wireless headphones, which are amazing, by the way. More on that in a minute. But Unofficially, this experience was so much more than a product launch. It was like a retreat. It was like going to camp with like-minded adventure seekers. If you follow my Instagram stories or highlights, then you got a good dose of how magical it was. We were running, swimming, hiking, meditating, rafting, doing breath work, eating amazing food. But most of all, just connecting, old school, campfire style. Uh, which included this opportunity to host this live conversation with Gwen. It was an experience I won't soon forget. I am super grateful to the Jaybird team for having us. And I do have to say that these new Vista headphones really are the best I've ever tried. The hype is definitely real. They're totally wireless. They're super light, the lightest, most compact, and most advanced buds Jaybird's ever made. And the fit is super snug and comfortable. There's no jiggling. And get this, these bad boys have an IPX7 rating, and that means they're fully waterproof and sweatproof. So 
They'll withstand any workout or weather conditions, and they don't slip in my ear either. It's amazing. The fit really is great. Plus, the battery life is insane. You get a full six hours of audio time on a full charge, plus 10 more in the charging case. And a quick five-minute charge will get you an hour of playtime. Plus, independent bud use extends total power to 32 hours. So if you've never used wireless headphones before, these stats are incredible. And I'm so happy that I can finally take a pair of wireless headphones on a long endurance run without having to worry about them dying on me midway through. And if that's not enough to get you stoked, Vista's cutting-edge JBS-1 wireless technology ensures crystal clear, zero lag stereo sound for music and calls and a reliable connection that pairs easily with your phone every single time. That means no connection breaks during your favorite song or podcast. To learn more, go to jbirdsport.com and check out the new Vista headphones and amplify your performance both on and off the trail. That's jaybird, J-A-Y-B-I-R-D sport.com. Okay, Gwen Jorgensen. Again, this took place live and outdoors before a small group in Montana a few weeks ago, and it was great. We talked about a number of things. We talked about Gwen's recent heel surgery, her recovery, and the impact that this has had on her training. The biggest differences she's experiencing between swim, bike, run, triathlon, in other words, uh, versus marathon training, why she selected the marathon as her next goal, the audaciousness of this goal that she set to win the Olympic gold medal, and what happened, like how she was received by the running community after making this announcement, Uh, her champion-only mindset. We spend a lot of time on that, where it comes from, whether her motivation is interior or exterior, how she navigates obstacles. We talk about balancing training with her dynamic family life. Uh, Her husband, Patrick Lemieux, who's great. He makes a cameo on the podcast, plus uh, parenting their son, Stanley. We talk about why agency is so important in her decision-making. And this risk certainty calculus that uh, she apparently seems to constantly be running. I really enjoyed this whole experience and this conversation, which includes a fair amount of audience Q&A, and uh, I think you will too. So without further ado, this is me and Gwen Jorgensen. It's funny, Gwen, like the other day in the van we were talking and I, and I told you that I generally don't like to interact too much with a podcast guest before having the conversation so we're not all like talked out. And, and Gwen says... Uh, don't worry, like I'll ignore you. But then <laughs> I don't like that either. Like that doesn't, that feels awkward and strange. So we chatted a little bit, but there's plenty to talk about. And I'm just super excited to be able to talk with you today and for you to share your story. Yeah, me too. Um, you definitely have done your research. Uh, just that little conversation we did have in the van and I'm excited to dive into uh, hopefully talking about some Thanks, stuff guys. and maybe I can even teach you something, which is uh, doubtful. <laughs> I'm sure you have plenty to teach me. Um, well, why don't we start with, uh, where you're at right now. I mean, we're at something like 210 days, I think, around that area before Olympic trials. Um, maybe walk us through kind of what you've been weathering and kind of where you're at at the moment in terms of your preparation. Yeah, I think, um, uh, oh, I don't know where to start. You know, I, I, I won gold in Rio in triathlon. And after that, I said, I want to I want to switch sports. And to make it even more difficult, not only switched sports. I had my first child. Um, so, you know, I had a, a really big uphill battle and I joined the Bowerman Track Club, which has just been an amazing experience. And I've been learning so much surrounding myself with the best athletes. And just recently, about eight weeks ago, I had surgery. Um, mm-hmm. So a setback for sure. Um, and for me, I'm focusing on just trying to get healthy and in triathlon everyone told me like the key to success is staying healthy. And I don't think I truly really took that to heart until I got injured um, just, you know, this past couple of years and injury is, is a really difficult thing to, to go through. Right. So explain this Haglund's deformity situation. <laughs> it has an ugly name, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> um, so I had a bone overgrowth on my heel and that bone overgrowth was rubbing against the t- Achilles tendon every time I took a step mm-hmm. and it was just uh, cutting away at that Achilles tendon and super painful. The bursas got annoyed and that was actually the most painful part for me um, was the, the bursa 
they swell and then they just cause excruciating pain. And, um, you know, like if somebody touched my Achilles, it was gut wrenching on the floor, screaming, wow. uh, just super painful. And this is like common in track yeah. and field, right? <laughs> I think a lot of people have this. I think in running, um, you know, injuries are always common, but the Hagelin's deformity, a lot of people actually have it and it doesn't cause everyone problems, but it's very, very common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's also called the pump bump from uh, wearing high heels, but I never uh, wear high heels. Yeah. Uh, yeah I didn't so get it So were you that. like cutting out the back of your shoes or how were you dealing with it before the surgery? Yep. I did a ton of things. Um, shoe related, uh, Nike created uh shoes without heel cups for me. Uh-huh. Um, so there wasn't anything back there really rubbing against the the heel. They made them custom. And then I also, you know, was doing PT, changing my gait, um, doing a lot of PT and um, things to keep my peroneals and soleus loose because that really helps uh, with just keeping the everything more mobile. So I feel like I tried to do everything I could. I don't think it's good to have surgery. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm really against it. And I, I waited a quite a long time to have surgery. Um, and I'm, I'm happy I did that. Well, Patrick just told me the interesting kind of backstory behind that. I mean, the tra- it sounds like the traditional route, at least as far as you guys were aware, was to literally slice the Achilles and kind of go in from the behind uh, to deal with it. And that's like no small thing. <laughs> like, right. I'm sure a lot of people don't come back from something like that. And it was almost uh, like out of the blue that you found out that there was this other doctor who was doing things a different way. Yeah, exactly. Most people that have this surgery, they cut the tendon and I think the return rate, um, it's like 50% or something if you can return to that elite level running and uh, we sh- shouldn't fact check me on that. I don't actually uh-huh. know, but it, you know, it's really hard to come back from and we knew personally a handful of people who had that surgery and weren't able to come back to sport. So it's to us, it was a, a non-starter. Like we can't do that because mm-hmm. we know that it could end my career uh, before I felt like I even could start it. So I had a teammate who said, oh, I had Hagelin's deformity, this surgeon, you know, he goes in microscopically on the sides, doesn't touch the tendon, like just shaves down the bone, takes care of the bursas. Um, and yeah, it was eye-opening. Right, he's like, oh, just call this guy, yeah. like problem solved, right? <laughs> And that seems to have worked. So you're like nine weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks out from that. Yep. Um, and so how's the rehab and like, wh- where are you at with, you know, getting back on, you know, to being a hundred percent? Yeah, I think I'm taking it in a really, I think it's a good approach. And the fact that I'm working with my PT and other people, and we always want to have my my bad leg, my right leg at 85% of my left leg. And we test it out doing different things. And so I'm not like, I'm gonna increase 5% every week or anything mm-hmm. like that. So it's hard to tell like when I'll be at 100%. But for me, you know, for like almost two years, I remember I was in, I think it was Mammoth Lakes and uh, with the Bowerman Track Club and there was a PT there and he was working on some stuff. And he's like, well, just get off the table and show me what it looks like to hop on one foot. And we all kind of like lived together, our teammates when we're at altitude. Uh-huh. And so all my teammates were kind of sitting there having dinner, watching me and I hopped on my left foot just fine. And I go, tried to hop on my right and I couldn't. And one of my teammates, Shelby Houlihan, just burst out laughing at me. She's like, you can't hop on a foot. Like every time you take a step when you're running, like, you know, it's like basically <laughs> yeah. hopping over and over again. Uh-huh. And I just, I couldn't do it. And so, you know, in my rehab right now, I'm able to hop on one foot and we're really getting mm-hmm. back to those basics and um, just starting from the the ground up. Yeah, one of the things that that you said uh, in one of your YouTube videos, and I think it's super wise, is you have this sense that recovery is a linear process. Like every week's gonna it's gonna be a little yep. bit better, and then finally you're gonna get to this 100% place, and it just doesn't work that way. Like some days are good, some weeks are good, but it's kind of one step forward, two steps back at times, and you just have to be patient, and you have to have that like mind body connection to know what's right for you, so that you're careful and you don't overdo it. Exactly. I, you know, I think we all think, oh, I can do, be better every single day. And I, I think we've been, been taught that a little bit, uh, that improvement happens on a daily basis and it, it doesn't. And, you know, you actually improve with rest. And, and for me, I'm not looking at the day-to-day improvement, but the week-to-week and mm. then month-to-month. And that's the the key, I think, to me being 100% and healthy, which is what I need to perform at the highest level. Yeah. All right. So Olympic trials, <laughs> 210 days or yep. whatever, like, how are you, like, what are you feeling? Like, are you feeling confident? You're excited? Like, how's this going? Are you going to race before this? Like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, you know, the 
they had come out a couple months ago with a new format for qualifying mm-hmm. and uh, track and field had and the trials had the marathon had a new time standard where you needed to go to 29 um, basically that was like the Olympic standard and I haven't gone that. So in my head it was, okay, I'm going to need to run that and then run the trials. Uh, um, and that would be a really, you need to do, you need to run that in order to get into the trials. No, I, like, so is I, already, it like I swimming had, where there's a time standard or. Yeah. So there's, there's a time standard to get into the trials, but then there was this other time standard where it was going to be not just the top three across the line at the trials. It was going to be, you had to be the top three with this standard. I see. Um, but, uh, they just like a week ago announced that they're kind of scrapping that, uh, not scrapping it, but another way to get the time is just place top five at a gold event. And they made Mm. the trials a gold event. So basically I feel really lucky that I don't have to rush into another marathon before the trials. Um, you know, you ask like, am I feeling ready? Definitely not. Um, Mm. you know, I think I've, I've set some really lofty goals and, uh, you know, I said I want to win gold in the marathon, and I think that can put a lot of people off, and I totally get that. Um, I get where people are coming from when that kind of – it seems a little bold and it yeah. can put people off. But for me, you know, I, I think I have a long way to go. I haven't done anything to prove that I can do that yet. But right. I, in my heart, like I know what I do on a daily basis, and I, I know that I haven't come anywhere near my potential in running. So the confidence is still there. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, uh-huh. um, I'm a pretty confident person, yeah. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, clearly, if you, there's a couple interesting things about that. I mean, you come off of this gold medal in, in triathlon, and I think the expectation was you would stay in triathlon, you were so dominant in the sport, or perhaps morph into a longer distance triathlete, like yep. a lot of people do. But instead, you make this kind of unpredictable left turn where you say, not only am I gonna walk away from triathlon and go into um, go into running, I'm gonna do marathon running and I'm not just gonna do marathon running, like I'm gonna win the Olympic gold medal in yep. the marathon, which is a very bold statement for somebody who kind of historically and kind of characteristically seemed like a pretty conservative person. Like you <laughs> didn't even quit your accounting job until you made the Olympic team. Like that's a very yeah. conservative streak that you have in you. So I'm trying to reconcile like that aspect of your personality with this very brash, bold, like, never go quiet, you know, <laughs> aspects to who you are. I mean, is that an evolution or are these just, is that some kind of duality that lives inside of you? I'd say it's a little bit of both. I, I definitely evolved into who I am through my success in triathlon and, and, and a big part through my husband, Patrick. Um, you know, I've always been very introverted and he's someone who's shown me the positives of being a little more extroverted and, um, putting my goals out there and mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I, I- But there's putting your goals out there and then there's like, I'm gonna do this thing that like no American woman has done since like- I The mean, first was, marathon. Yeah, yeah, the first marathon in the Olympics. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's good though, like- There must it, have been it, some people who didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a lot of people <laughs> yeah. that didn't and I, I appreciate yeah. that and I understand it. And I think for me, it holds it holds me accountable mm-hmm. and it, it also holds my team around me, my husband, my coach, you know, the thousands of people basically that go into my team. Um, you know, they know what I want to do. And um, yeah, I think it's exciting too. And I think it's why you think about every athlete who goes to the Olympic trials, even if they don't say they want to qualify for the Olympics, I'm sure that's their goal. And then mm-hmm. that every athlete that goes to the Olympics I really believe that everyone there wants to win um, uh-huh. and they're just not saying it. Right, it's like, it doesn't feel like it's polite conversation right. to like actually be bold enough to say that out loud. And I think part of it has evolved as well, just, you know, being, I'm when I first started triathlon, I was very, very timid in, in things and I had trouble actually on the swim because people would touch me and I'd say, oh, I don't wanna be touched. Like, if you wanna go, okay, go ahead. I'll let you just like swim <laughs> by me, your turn, yep. Uh-huh. Um, and you know, I worked with psychologists and learned like, you know what, it's okay. It's even though I'm female, I can be assertive and I, I can just kind of be myself and know, you know, I am here and prove that I belong there. Yeah. Well, let's take it back a little bit. Like you start as a swimmer mm-hmm. and 
you are like the prototypical age group. Like you're all like I this I was that kid too. So I really relate to that. Like just being like, it's all about time standards and making nationals yep. and all of that. And you have your goal times on your bulletin board or on your ceiling or whatever it is. I did have it on the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. The ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, those and, glow up stars that right. Stan, my son Stanley will probably have someday. <laughs> and there's like uh, there's an obsessiveness to that oh, kind yeah. of lifestyle, right? That's unusual for a young person, I think. Um, and you had this Olympic dream for swimming and it took you a while to kind of realize like, hey, that's probably not gonna happen <laughs> as a walk on at, at, at UW. Yeah, right? I mean, I never made like a junior national team. Like right. it was very apparent that I wasn't anywhere near <laughs> that uh -huh. level. And, and we were talking about this the other day, but kind of sprinkled like, like there's this light dusting across your story of like little incidents that happen along the way where you show this prowess as a runner, but you're turning a blind eye to it because you're so focused on swimming that you just can't hear anything else. Yeah, um, you know, I remember, you know, I feel very fortunate. My parents put me through college. They, they paid for my college and I walked on Mm -hmm. a D1 team at Wisconsin. And I was getting letters from schools to run. And, you know, some of them would be like these big packets. And my parents would be like, well, what if there's like a scholarship offer in there? I'm like, I don't care. I'm not opening it. I don't want to see it. It's going in the garbage. Like, I don't want to do that. And I think for me, it was all about, I want to do what, what makes me happy. And swimming is what mm. made me happy. It's weird because it you well, know, you wouldn't even go in the lake yesterday. So it's definitely not that not the case anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's right. changed a lot. You know, growing up swimming was it's this beautiful thing where it's just it's refreshing, it's rejuvenating, but for some reason I just, you know, I put so much time, so much effort mm -hmm. into it and I really learned through swimming how to deal with failure and how you can still, you know, I I would go in in college before all my teammates, stay in after, get an, you know, videotaped and analyze my stroke and all, I was doing everything I could to match their level and I just was never able right, to get there. Right, happen. But there's something interesting about the bullheadedness, like the fact that you were so determined, like it's, it's this great strength about your personality that I think is part and parcel of what makes you successful, but also this impediment, like this literally an Achilles heel, right? That's preventing <laughs> you from seeing this reality right in front of you that you would be a much more successful athlete if you just paid a little bit more broader attention to your talents. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I'm definitely, I always say I'm really stubborn and I think that's a great quality for me and mm -hmm. it's made me very successful, but it can also uh, have have a downside, I guess, but you know, I, I I look back and if I would have done running in college right away, I, I eventually started running my junior year, mm -hmm. but if I would have done it my freshman year, I wouldn't have been happy. I don't think I would have been successful. Yeah. I wouldn't have learned how to deal with failure like, like I did. Right. So it's actually the swim coach at Wisconsin that reached out to the track coach. Right? <laughs> yep. Like this guy's gonna make it happen for <laughs> you almost. And then there's an interesting kind of irony in that, the well, the men's track coach at Wisconsin ultimately ends up becomes the becoming the Bowerman coach, who's your coach today. Yep. A lot of connections. So there's like this and weird serendipitous, like this is all like written in the stars. <laughs> yeah, it is very interesting. Yeah. And you know, my swim coach, both of my swim coaches, Eric Hansen and, and Jeff Hansen, unrelated Hansons, but they they encouraged me to to try out for that track mm -hmm. team. And I thought, you know, for for me, I really held them. I respected them so much. And I thought, you know what, if they believe this is a good decision, like maybe it is. And yeah. um, it's nice to have that in life, having those people who you can really trust. Right, so you start running track and field, like how long before you realize like, oh, this is just gonna be my new thing? Like, you, do you get success immediately? I did have success immediately, um, but you know, I, so I joined like there's cross country and then there's indoor track and outdoor track. Uh -huh. And I joined after outdoor track had already started. It was like a month or two in, or a month in uh, outdoor track. And I joined the team and I had immediate success, almost made NCAAs. And even though that summer, even though I had so much success over the summer, yeah. I really debated like, do I want to swim or do I want to run? And I still showed up to swimming <laughs> practices every day. Like you're I still killing do... yourself and you're not even <laughs> anywhere close to making NC2A standards yep. in swimming. Yeah. And you're like literally almost immediately make them make it in running. Yeah. It and was... you're still like, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> I think, you know, swimming was just such a big part of my life. And I, I, yeah, it just was a big decision to make. And I think 
I've never been one to do something because somebody tells me to. And I felt like everyone was telling me to run. And I, I kind of was stubborn in the fact that I didn't want to do something just because other people mm -hmm. wanted me to. And so I really str struggled and had a hard time realizing, like, is this something I actually want to do? And it, it was, mm -hmm. but it just took me a while to figure that right. out. So you then go on to this celebrated career. Like you, what do you win big tens? You had like, yep. you, know, you had like a lot of accolades as a track and field athlete. But when that chapter was over, like, that was it, right? You were just gonna like putting putting the athlete Gwen in the rear view mirror and going well, on into the, yeah. into the world. I wanted to run on the professional level out of college. Uh -huh. And I remember talking to my college coach and he was kind of like, eh, I don't know if you're good enough. Um, you know, he actually suggested I do triathlon and I was like, eh, um, that doesn't interest me. And so yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was all about supporting myself. I wanted to be independent, and you know, I looked at my available options, and it was like, oh, you could be paid, you know, ten grand to run mm -hmm. professionally, but I can't live on my own off of ten grand. So for me, it was like, okay, if I can't do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna do accounting, and I'm just gonna start that life. Yeah. So where does that come from? Like this this need, this compulsion to like be self self sufficient and self supporting? Because I think a lot of people if given the opportunity to explore their potential as a, as a professional athlete would be like, I'm doing that. Like if I have to be a waiter or do, you know, get some odd jobs or whatever to make it work, like I'm, I'm in. And you're like, I don't want that life. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think I know the answer to that question. I think it's mostly the way my parents raised me, but you know, I did have, I could have pursued sport um, in running even. I remember my parents having a couple conversations mm -hmm. with me saying, you can live at home, we'll help, we'll help you out if you wanna keep you know, running and you can only do athletic careers once, you know, you can't like do it when you're age 50, yeah. you can't Ernst go back and, and Young say- Ernst Young is not going out yeah, of exactly. yep. soon. Yeah, so it was, uh, I definitely had that opportunity, but I, I don't know where that stubbornness of, I need, I think it's, I think I've always just been super stubborn, super, independent and kind of, I wanna do my own thing. And I, I don't wanna, I, I just don't wanna rely on others. It has to be others. your idea too. Yes, oh yeah. Because <laughs> what's confusing is you're, you're weighing like, should I quit swimming and do track and field? Like I love swimming, but I'm good at this. And then when presented with the opportunity of like, hey, you might be a good triathlete. Like, hey, let's just look at this on paper. You're like, no, like that would, to me, that seems to solve that dilemma for you where you don't have to pick between these two things and you get to be awesome because you're good at both of them. Yeah. I, and you're like, I don't want that. Yeah, you know, I, my my college running coach, Jim, he he always tells the story of me. He said once, he said something about like, you know, you should consider doing triathlon. And I just said, if you ever say that again, I'm quitting the track team. Uh -huh. And I was just like, don't so try to convince that's what me. I'm, like, what is that? <laughs> like, that's what I'm trying to like put my thumb on. Yeah, like, I don't know. I mean, I think everyone's just born differently. And I just, in me, I was born with this stubbornness of I wanting- I think it has to be your idea. It has to be your idea. Like For if sure. you come up with the idea of being a triathlete, maybe. Right, it would have yeah, been yeah. a, but I didn't, like when they, so USA Triathlon came to me and they said, uh -huh. we think you'd be good. Right. And after months of calling me every week, I, I finally gave in a little bit. Um, but you know, if, I, when they did talk to me, I didn't even know triathlon was an Olympic sport. So they were calling uh -huh. me and it was like a month in of talking to them. And I was like, oh wait, you mean it's not the Ironman? You mean I don't have to be on a TT bike? Like what? what is this? So um, yeah. It wasn't just them, like it was Barb Lindquist calling yeah. you, right? Yeah, an know, Olympian. An Olympian, and, yep. and she's telling you like, listen, on paper, you're better than yeah. me. <laughs> and you're like, no, Ernst and Young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, I, I still, you know, I think, if you go from the high school level to the college level in a sport, you realize how big of a jump it is. And mm -hmm. then you go from the college level to a pro level, like it's an even bigger jump. And for me, I was like, do I have what it takes to make this jump into a professional field in a sport I've never done? Like mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't believe what she was telling me. Yeah. And here again is this arc because you had had rapid success when you, fully embraced running, right? And now you're bold enough to say like, I'm gonna win the Olympic gold medal in marathoning, um, but you weren't quite ready to make that leap and be that bold in that moment. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think- But bold enough to start training a little bit. Yeah, Barb eventually presented it as, well, you know, just do it on the side. Like, aren't you mm -hmm. working out still? And I was like, yeah, I am. She's, 
just kind of, yeah, started it that way. And, um, you know, in my first triathlon, I got my pro card. And in that year, maybe it was the following year, I qualified for the Olympics. And <laughs> it was... Like, just let's sit on that for a moment. <laughs> like, you're so casual about that. But, like, you literally just walked into the sport and, like, within, I think it was, like, 17 months later, you were on the Olympic team. Yeah, but it's, you know... and. Looking back, that was actually a really hard time in my athletic career for me. I, I felt guilty um, for that success, mm -hmm. and because a lot of people had been paying their dues and working right, you know. And out. I, I remembered what it was like as a swimmer and seeing all these other people being successful when I felt like I was doing everything, if not more, um, and I wasn't seeing any success. But you know, then I, I look back and I think, okay, I've carried over all those tools I've learned of of doing the little things, being prepared, and I always got you know, made fun of or, or looked at a little bit differently because in triathlon, I was always super prepared. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'd bring, I think to the Olympics, brought four bikes, I'm looking at my yeah. husband and make sure yeah. that's the correct number. Um, you know, it's like, but why would you ever need four bikes? You know, you, but it was just, we always wanted to be over prepared and doing those, those little things that, that set you up for uh, success. Right. So first Olympiad, 2012, you flat out, um, but by that point, like when you made the when you made the first Olympic team, then you took a leave of absence from Ernst and Young, right? Like, yep. like now yep. maybe I can take this seriously. <laughs> um, and then fast forward to then you just dominate the sport in the interim, and then in 2016 you win the Olympic gold medal. Um, and I asked you this in the in the van the other day, um, as somebody who grew up as a swimmer and had this Olympic dream as a swimmer. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think it would have meant more to you had you won an Olympic gold medal as a swimmer than as a triathlete? And I think your response is super interesting. <laughs> well, I don't remember what it was, but it was, I mean, 100%. Yeah. Like it would have went, meant way more to me as, as a swimmer. You know, I grew up glued to the TV when the Olympics, the Summer Olympics were on. And all I wanted to watch was all the swimming events. Like that was to me like the pinnacle and, you know, something that I just was so immersed in. Yeah, triathlon. I didn't even know existed. Yeah, well, it was. It's an. It's this again. It goes back to this was somebody else's idea. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and and like almost like your success without you know being fully prepared, but also like keeping a distance from it. I yep. think. Yep. Um, and now I see a difference with marathoning because you're really you really want to own that completely for yourself. So what is the difference in those relationships between triathlon and? And, running and what you're doing now yeah yeah i think you know triathlon chose me and mm. um you know it's it's something that i think success is, can be fun right um it can be enjoyable but but for me i just really have this i never really 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 wanted to do triathlon like i, I wanted mm. to do running and well, i wanted to do swimming first and and then once in college. Reluctant, the reluctant yes. runner before that. Okay. <laughs> and now I'm all in, but it's, you know, for running, I, I remember making the decision and it wasn't something that was overnight. I had been thinking about it for years, um, you know, two or three years before 2016, I had called Jerry, um, my, my current running coach and said, what do you think of this crazy idea if after 2016, I wanted to start running? Because mm -hmm. um, I had been improving on my runs, I um, mean, you know, I'd done some open 10Ks throughout my triathlon career and I just kept getting faster. And I thought, oh, I, I think I could maybe make it. Um, mm -hmm. And I talked to some other people and had them like analyze, you know, with my VO2 max, like, what do we think we can do? Um, and yeah, I really believed I could be successful in running. And right, I, so you brought an analytical approach to this decision. It wasn't just like I, you woke up one day and pie in the sky to no, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, I, it was very analytical, but it was also very passion driven. Uh -huh. um, triathlon just wasn't, uh, to keep doing triathlon, it, it didn't seem exciting to me. You know, I, I did everything I could to reach my goal and it's not exciting for me to wake up and mm. do, try to do just the same thing. Like me, I'm, I'm really motivated by things that are a challenge and running was going to be a challenge, but I also believed I could do it. And again, you know, you keep coming, you're convincing me now that I, uh, everything just needs to be my decision. I remember when I made yeah. this decision and I talked to my husband and I, he'd probably deny this now because he's like the number one supporter of, yes, I think you can do this in running. But he was very 
cautious. And he was like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, this Uh is our livelihood. You're really good at this. Like, why do you want to switch? He was very hesitant. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like it either has to be your decision or there has to be this like inception process where you believe that it's your decision. Yes. But I think to kind <laughs> of make it, it yes. make it like <laughs> readily apparent for everyone who's listening, like when you won the Olympic gold medal, like you were, you know, this massive name in the sport and the sponsorship dollars were very real. Yep. And, you know, you could have, you know, rode this out for quite some time and expanded on it to make a very good living doing something that you're extremely good at and having the world applaud you for it. So again, it goes to, it goes back to this like, okay, now you're becoming this risk taker because that is a gamble. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. go into this entirely new sport with this very bold claim. No one's ever done this. I mean, really the only semi example of anybody doing anything similar to this would be like Sheila Taormina, right? Who did three sports. She did- yeah. Swimming, yep. triathlon, and modern pentathlon. Yep. Which we could talk about modern pentathlon. Maybe that's <laughs> next. If You'd like have that. to convince me that but it's my I, decision to do <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, though, right. So. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm put, the inception <laughs> begins now. Um, there's no precedent for this, and 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 it and it does. I would imagine that your sponsors were like, "Whoa, like that's not what we signed up for. Like this is a different thing." So, a hundred percent. You know, there's yeah. very real repercussions to this decision on like your bottom line. Yeah, and you know. Um, going into it, I knew that. I knew when I made that decision that every one of my sponsors could drop me. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was something that I believed I could do. And I I really think I've, the things I've been successful at, I've taken a risk. You know, I I took a risk by switching sports in college. I think that I hadn't run in like three years and I just all of a sudden started running and I became very successful. And in triathlon, when I became successful, I took big risks. Um, And you know, my, my husband quit his job and we moved abroad. We didn't really have much money, that many sponsors at the time. And I was supporting him full time. And I remember the first time I, I performed really well at a, a race and I attribute part of it because my husband had convinced me to take a risk and fly business class and mm-hmm. spend that extra money and invest in yourself. And I think I've really learned throughout my triathlon career that I need to invest in myself and um, you need to take big risks if you wanna have big rewards. Yeah. I wanna talk about the family stuff in a second, but first um, I'm interested in what you've learned about the differences because you've now done you know, these, these three different sports that are all kind of related, but very different in their own regard. Like what are the, what, how do they inform each other? Like, what have you learned? Like, what, what about swimming informed being a marathon runner, if anything, like what are the mistakes that you've learned and like, how do they complement each other? I suppose in terms of like, just being a, being an athlete and, and adopting like a well-honed athlete's mindset. I think uh, there's so many things, um, you know, swimming definitely taught me how to deal with failure and how to keep, keep at it and, and, do everything you can to be prepared and to succeed. And I think, you know, a lot of times there, people talk about having a, a fear of failure, but I think, you know, running taught me that you can also have a fear of success. Um, and and that's something that is very interesting. I um, you know, I, I think I had a fear of success in running and I had to overcome that and, and learn how to deal with that. And I think just- Did the, that manifest in like self-sabotage or like how did exactly. you become aware of that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, little things like uh, self-sabotaging, like oh, I'm, my watch is off today because I, there's no way I was running that fast or, mm-hmm. or and as well, just feeling like guilty, I think for, for my success and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I think I learned the most about how to be successful just in triathlon with my triathlon coach, Jamie Turner. And he just, he really, he was a coach. He wasn't a psychologist, but he taught me so much about the mentality of viewing things as an investment, not a sacrifice, mm-hmm. focusing on the process, not the outcome. You can't mm-hmm. focus on being, you know, I, I said, I've said this big goal that I want to win the Olympics, but that's, that's not what my goals are written down in my journal that I write in every day. Those goals are process based of, you know, what do I need to do? I need to surround myself with the best. I need to be confronted with the world standard on a daily basis. And it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard because I'm going to be failing over and over at the beginning, but I need to continue to pound that rock. And um, I believe there's success on, on the other side. Yeah. Well, my sense is that your drive is, is, 
internal, like you're competing against yourself. It's not about 100%. beating other people. Is that accurate? That is very accurate. Yeah. And I think that's the best way to success. I think, you know, in, in when I grew up swimming, it was all about the outcome. And that led to a very, um, a, a life that wasn't fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I felt like my results defined who I was. And that's just no way to live. I think it, it leads to a lot of negativity. And once I've realized, okay, focus on the process. And even if the outcome doesn't come, I know that I'm making myself a better person on a daily basis. And that's what will lead to success and, and happiness. Cause I don't think you can have one without the other. Yeah. So how does that, um, how does that look in terms of how you navigate obstacles and setbacks? Like what's the mental approach? Like how do you deconstruct that and work your way through it? Yeah, um, you know, I, I like to not, I like to disengage from my sport. So when I'm not at a workout or I come home from a workout, if it went poorly, I, I don't, I write in my journal every day and I like, but that's it. Like I don't, you don't go into a shame spiral. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like, you know, that was one day uh -huh. tomorrow will be better. Like, what did I learn from it? Let's move on. Um, and it's something, you know, it's kind of like we talked about earlier things being linear, linear and that was with injury. But I think the same thing in, in training, you're not every day, you can't have a PR and right. you can't focus on that outcome because there are different reasons for when you're fatigued and in a different training cycle. And it might not be about getting that outcome, but more about focusing mm -hmm. on performing under fatigue or, you know, performing when you're really, uh, yeah, just not prepared, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. So how did you make the, the choice to go to Bowerman? I did, uh, you know, I think I called a lot of different coaches and Bowerman was definitely my, my top choice. And I feel really, really honored that they let me come in. It's a very exclusive Yeah, like group. how does that work? <laughs> like, I'm, I wanna know like the, like, do you call There's, them up and say, hey, can I join? Or do they call so you like, how does it like, <laughs> like, what is the, and like, do you pay it? Like, how does it, I don't understand this. I've been world. pursuing Jerry, I told you for yeah. like three years, you know? So uh -huh. I just gotta be really persistent. Um, but it's, so running, was unique and, and different than triathlon in, in the way that running coaches are often sponsor based. So uh, Jerry is a Nike coach. So mm -hmm. my first uh, step, I guess, was, you know, joining Nike um, and then, you know, having so Jerry you have to be on a board. Nike athlete first before you can even be part of the team. And then Jerry needs to want you to be uh -huh. on the team. So, you know, there's a lot Six. of things to. It's step like through being on Tinder or something. Like whole <laughs> Thankfully, thing, I, right? I found my <laughs> husband before Tinder, so I don't know about much of that. I don't either. But, <laughs> um, but, uh, but now you're in this position where you're surrounded by these amazing athletes that push you every day. Yeah, I think and like, you yeah. asked, you know, why did I want yeah. to join Bowerman and Jerry in the last Olympic cycle? I think he was coaching, it's either seven or eight women, and six or seven of them all qualified for the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I had a really good uh, success rate and also just being able to be surrounded by Shalane Flanagan, Amy mm -hmm. Craig, the the best marathoners in the world. You know, they have world medals, they have Shalane won New York. Um, so just being surrounded by them and seeing, you know, what do I need to do? What, how fast do I need to run? Yeah. What, are the, what does everything look like? Like that's something where I'm able to just learn a lot from them. Did I, I have to ask, like, did they just embrace you? Because you're you're coming in, they're like, oh, this girl, you know, she's claiming like she's gonna do this <laughs> and that. And like, you know, and they must be like, yeah, all right, come Get on. Get out, right, right. eye roll, like, yeah, Was sure. it like a little weird at first? Like, did you have to win their trust and? I mean, I, no, it was it was super strange in my eyes. I think Shalane, um, if you know much about Shalane, they talk about like the Shalane effect and uh -huh. she on our team just empowers women so much by building them up and, and she's a big believer in building others up. Um, you know, she's at the top, but she believes everyone can be at the top with her. And just having someone like that on the team is something that's incredible. I think especially with, with female athletes, I think that's yeah. very unique to find. Um, and it's another reason why I was really pursuing Bowerman hard. Yeah, I mean, that's inspiring. That takes a lot of moral character yeah. to be able yeah. to hold that space. And so and important And it's very for, authentic, for like she's not- female athletes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. And it does, like it, it definitely, you know, when you're helping somebody else out, it helps them, but it also, I think, helps yourself when you have people around you becoming better, everyone mm -hmm. just on a whole, you're forced to become 
better athletes and better yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the family stuff. So Yay. Patrick is like the engine behind this whole thing. <laughs> like it's amazing. So you guys met on a group ride yep. um, years ago. Uh, David got married and he was a professional cyclist at the time and then um, retired from his career to, to literally be you know, the support system for you achieving your dreams, which is like, no, that's not a small thing. No, I mean, it's huge. I don't think there's many people that would do that. And I, I don't think there's many men who are confident enough uh -huh. to do that either. And um, just having that support and that belief is something that's been super critical. And, you know, it's also, he, he's actually the one that's allowed me to go after my, my goals and my dreams. I wasn't uh -huh. willing to move abroad if he wasn't going to go with me. And, you know, I say all this, but I actually, I'm remembering like the day he told me he was going to, he had, he was still doing cycling on this, on the side and he was over abroad with me. And I remember he flew out to one of my races and um, he said, I'm, I'm not going back. I'm gonna stay here full time with you. I'm gonna quit cycling. This is where I need to be. And well, my first reaction was I'm playing for that plane ticket back. Who's gonna get that refund? Like we need to get that <laughs> refund figured out. Um, but he- uh, Always the accountant. I know, yes. But then, you know, my second thing was that I thought was, oh, man, I don't want you to regret this. I don't want you to like, mm wish that you would have stayed in cycling and he just yeah. wouldn't give it up. And I'm really yeah. thankful he didn't. Cause then there would be resentment. Exactly. That would ultimately probably destroy the relationship. So it has yeah. to be for the right reasons. But it seems like it's working out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's working out really well. Yeah. And he's, he's very opposite of me. He's very extroverted. He He's taught me a lot about how sport can change other people's lives, which has mm -hmm. been eye opening for me and actually made sport a lot more enjoyable for me. Um, I think he's helped me be more bold. He's helped me just just be confident. Like I, I don't care about what anyone else thinks or says. Um, his his opinion def definitely matters. Um, but you know, like there's so many trolls on the internet, and I mm -hmm. think that can really, as especially as an athlete or a, a public figure like yourself, like I think that can affect you. And for me, I just he's taught me how that just it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's empowering. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's definitely been life-changing. And it's, it's something that I think, it just leads to a happy life. You're not uh -huh. stressing out about what other people think. Like it doesn't matter. Right. Everyone's, not everyone's gonna always support you 100%. And as long as you are doing you and you know that you're becoming a, a better a person, then that's what's important. Right. And you have Stanley who's like two yeah. now. Um, so you're juggling being a mom and um, you know, being in a, in a healthy marriage and trying to live like uh, you know, a well-rounded balanced life at the same time that you're chasing this very audacious goal. So how do you like make all of that, all those pieces fit together? So you're you know, paying attention to the important things. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's challenging for sure. Um, and it was a huge adjustment as an athlete. You're so focused on recovery. Um, and then you have a child and you can't just sit right. in bed all day with your feet up. Um, thankfully, my son is like this very unique person who he only lets me read to him and he loves reading. But uh -huh. I think he just knows that like I need to recover and relax. So like I'll come home and he'll literally sit with me for like an hour and we just read books. So, um, you know, we found a system that works where I'm able to get my recovery in. But I also think he's helped a ton with, you know, before I had him, Patrick and I, we removed ourselves from sport um, when we'd come home. And now it's just so easy to do. Like when I come home, I don't even need to try to not mm. think about sport. It's just all focused on Stanley. How's mm -hmm. he doing? What's going on? And it's just like, no matter how, you know, like I think the injury that I had was, it was the hardest thing I've, I've gone through in sport. And it was made, I was still able to remain happy throughout that because I came home to this child who was just right smiling all the time and, and just made me and ultimately you're, you, that keeps you engaged in the sport too, long-term. Like the, I talked with Kerry Walsh Jennings about this. Yep. Like there's this sense that 
um, oh, if you live this monastic lifestyle that you would be the ultimate like badass athlete. Like it's just you and what you need to do and there's no family and like <laughs> you're just training, like, you know, what the life of a swimmer or a tri- most triathletes, right? Um, and what Carrie had to kind of evolve into and what she's learned and embraced and believes is that living this family life actually does make her a better athlete because it, it, it because her life is so full in all the important ways that she's able to stay engaged in the sport. Um, in a way that she doesn't think that she could or would have otherwise. I 100% agree with that. And I also, you know, I also think it's really good to empower other women and show them that, you know, you can have a family Mm -hmm. and you can still be successful in whatever you're doing, sport uh, or, or a different job. And that's something that I'm, I'm really passionate about as well. I'm not gonna lie, you know, I thought like I had a really easy pregnancy and I was like, oh, this is easy, this will be great. Like pop the kid out, be running in two weeks, we good. And it was not like that at all. Um, you know, I think I, I definitely uh, underestimated the difficulties of child labor. It seemed like you labor. got back to training pretty quick though. <laughs> um, I, I was bedridden for yeah. close to a month, I'd oh, say. Wow. Um, but it, you know, it's, once I started running, it definitely was able to, to come back pretty quick. But I think it is like important for women to know that you can have it all. You can have the family and mm-hmm. the career and it is, they both complement each other. Right. So one of the things that that uh, distinguishes you from a lot of other athletes out there is that you you're becoming this YouTube star. <laughs> can we talk about that a little bit? We we can talk about that. I know you this know, is I, like Patrick's idea, it is. but like I love the channel, and we were talking about this a little bit in the van the other day too. Like I just think it's great, and I think it's it's de rigueur for all all. I think all professional athletes need to like take notice of of what you and a handful of other people are doing by sharing your life in a transparent way and showing the behind the scenes process of like what it takes to do what you do really not only is super um, inspirational and informative, but it just humanizes you. Like we get to see like, yes, you are a mom and here's how you manage that and do that. And um, it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I actually, uh, I struggled with a lot and I was very against it. Patrick really had to convince mm-hmm. me that it was my idea. Um, <laughs> but it was something for me that we talked about a lot because I I was saying like, okay, well, I don't really want to be a personality. And that's all that YouTube is mm-hmm. about, right? It's creating like this personality and like a brand and all, yeah. all these things. And I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be about that necessarily. Um, you know, I, I want to be about the performing athlete and I'm not going to do this if it takes away from my performance in any way. So, you know, we had uh, Talbot Cox, who's my content creator come out and he's actually someone who I think is, uh, I, I really enjoyed him and he's made it so easy. And that's really why I've been on board. And he's someone who, he was a super fan of mine. Like I met him at a race once, big cut up face of me. And he created this job opportunity for himself and Mm -hmm. he went after what he wanted to do. And that's something that really, I think made me respect him so much and allowed him to come in. And he makes it easy for me where he feels like family. So it's, it doesn't distract me. It doesn't take away from my Mm -hmm. training. Um, so that's why I'm able to do it. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, and he's he's also the guy, he does Lionel Sanders yep. videos as well, which I enjoy watching. And he just keeps getting better and better too. <laughs> um, and they're super engaging, you know? And I just think like from a, from you are a professional and I think increasingly so, this has to be part of the professional equation, like in terms yeah, of how you, connect with and, and extend the reach of the sponsors that you work with. It's just it's just what it means to be like a successful professional triathlete. Exactly. I mean, I, I think, mean, you athlete know, athlete in general. If I, yeah, triathlete, yeah, I mean, you're I trying know. to convince Slip. me sub, no, subliminal that messages. That was another inception. Um, yeah. You don't uh, need to go back to triathlon. <laughs> I think, you know, um, definitely something that, you know, if I could, I would compete and no one would be watching. There would be no fans, no media, no nothing. Uh-huh. But the reality is that's, I couldn't do this as a, at a living, as a living if that was how it works. And, you know, I, everyone has a part of their job, I think that you just accept that you have to do that maybe you don't love. Uh-huh. And, and that's probably the part of my job that I don't love, but I've been increasingly, I've been becoming more and more apt to, to enjoy it just because yeah. I, so many people come up to me and they say, oh, I did my first triathlon because I saw this episode or mm. I love the books you're reading to Stanley or do like just all these things that like, that's a great idea. I'm going to try cooking with my child too, mm-hmm. or all these different things where I feel like I'm able to hopefully inspire others to, to get active, to 
have that balance and to go after big goals and and be able to have that family yeah. balance in life too. Well, there's a there's a groundedness to you and like a humility because you're like, all right, we're gonna do this thing. Like, I don't, does anybody care? Like, <laughs> why is this interesting? But okay, we'll do it. And then like, you know, you look like, oh, a lot of people are interested in this. And, you know, people wanna know like how it is that you do what you do. So anyway, I think it's cool. Um, I wanna open this up to, um, all of you guys to ask some questions. But before I do that, one final thing um, I wanted to ask you, which is as somebody who's in the public eye and people have opinions about athletes, like what's the one thing that you think people get wrong about you? Like that they're not really understanding about what it is that you're trying to do or who you are? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm someone who like does, I, you know, I touched on earlier, like I don't really listen to a lot of comments online. I'm not somebody who's like going on and reading uh, what are that? I don't right. even know what they call forums, <laughs> you know, like, um, but I think just probably the, the biggest recent misconception is just with this switch and me being so bold and saying, I wanted to, mm. I want to win or that I say I'm going to win. Um, and, you know, viewing that as something that's maybe putting down other athletes. Um, I've had a, a couple of people comment like, well, what you, what do you think about all these other athletes then? And, and for me, it's no, it's like, this is a personal goal. This is what keeps me motivated on a daily basis. And also I just, I think it's good to set, say your goals out loud. And, um, you know, I actually had somebody recently, uh, a teammate of mine actually came up to me and was like, oh, I, I read a research article that saying your goals out loud creates this atmosphere where um, you don't succeed in your goals as much because people just give you praise and you get praise from people saying, oh, that's a great goal to go after. Right, like without ha actually having to achieve Right, goal. but um, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot because I, for me, I feel like I've always done my best when I've set big goals and I've been very vocal about them. But then I think like, well, I haven't gotten much like praise. Like, yeah, Gwen, you can do it. Like no one's really said that. So maybe, it, <laughs> maybe that study is true and yeah. my goal is just too big uh -huh. <laughs> for other people, but yeah. yeah. Interesting. All right. Uh, Let's open this up. Does anybody question? Do we have, we have a roaming mic here, right? Okay, I've had this question like the whole time. Um, what are the most important things that you do for yourself to keep your mental strong and how do you deal with self-doubt? Yeah, um, I work with a psychologist, but I think my, my biggest thing is I, my journal that I keep every day and when very early on in my professional career, when I first started as a triathlete, um, I guess it was my my triathlon coach, Jamie Turner, he noticed that I was self-sabotaging. And he said, we need to start writing down every day three things that you did well. Um, I also wrote down three things that I could improve on a daily basis. But for me at the time, I was really struggling with um, just accepting that I was doing things that were good. And being able to go back in that journal and see the things that I was doing successfully on a daily basis really gave me a lot of confidence going into races. Um, it allowed me to change my mindset as well to view things in a very objective manner um, instead of just letting my feelings view things. It was like, okay, let's get back to like, what processes did you do today that were good and which ones could have you improved on? Mm. And I think that's allowed me to overcome a lot of- Is that a practice that you still- adhere to it is i take mm -hmm. uh, a break every once like once every year like when i have a downtime i spend two weeks where i don't write anything down just to kind of give myself a little break but mm -hmm. yeah i still do that to this day yeah that's cool i have a question about your drive and where that comes from <laughs> and if the origins of that are in some kind of insecurity maybe or perceived hmm. deficit in other areas of your life like what what is it that made you latch on to swimming at the time and just gave you that incredible drive that's so unique. I, I, uh, with swimming, I think it was me wanting something that was my own. Um, you know, my, my parents growing up, they forced my parent, or they forced me and my sister to each do at least one sport and one musical thing. And I hated the violin, I remember. And that's what I chose because I, I like, she started us when we were like five and my sister, older sister was doing violin at the time. And I thought she was awesome. She is awesome. I still think that. Um, so I copied her and did violin, but as the years went on, I just dreaded 
I hated playing the violin. It took away from swimming. It was just, it was something that I felt like I didn't choose. I didn't enjoy it, but I had this drive still to be good at it. Um, you know, I was first chair violin. I was like, I, I was successful at it, but I hated it. And I just have always had this drive. Like if I like it or if I don't, like I've had this drive to just, I'm going to be the best at whatever I'm doing. And I'm, I'm going to try that. And, um, you know, then in, in the flip side in swimming, I loved it. And I think the swimming thing was just, it was my own. It wasn't my, nobody in my family ever swam. Nobody wanted me to swim. Like mm-hmm. I actually got involved in swimming, um, on a competitive swim team because, my parents wanted to get me out of the water and they thought like, well, if we put her in like the swim team, she's going to get sick of it and then she's not going to like it. But it just like grew this obsession for me. Back to you choosing it for yourself. Like agency is a big deal with you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We're at the origin of ideas and yeah. Yeah. So what's going on with your parents now? They're good? (laughs) Oh yeah. My parents are great. I mean, I love them and I actually, you know, with my own son, I want to encourage the same thing. Like, I think Mm -hmm. it was great to give me the choice of what instrument and what sport I wanted to play, but, you know, not having the choice of having to choose one of those. I don't know if that makes sense, Uh but, you know, forcing you to do an activity, but letting you choose the activity, I think is something that's, uh, I think it's something that allowed me to be very successful. And it taught me how in violin and the orchestra, how to be successful at something that I hated. And then in swimming, how to Mm. put my head down with something that I love. Mm. Sanjay. Usually children of professional athletes are unbelievably talented. Like, <laughs> how, how would you deal with uh, your, your, your son exhibiting an incredible amount of athletic prowess at like three or four or even <laughs> ten? Yeah, you know, I think um, I probably, I, you know, I kind of showed that in running early on and, and my parents they encouraged me to run, but they never forced me to. And I I feel like I really enjoyed that. I think if you force someone in, you force a child into a sport that they don't want to be in, I don't think that's the right route at all. Like maybe they could have success, but are they going to be happy? I personally don't think so. So for me, you know, if maybe our son Stanley will be amazing. He's, he's a big boy. Like maybe he'd be really great at, I don't know what, Rugby, sure. Mm. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to force him to do it, though, if he doesn't want to. There's a very cute clip, though, in one of your videos where you're on the compu trainer in your <laughs> training room and he's got his own, like, stationary bike that plays, a, like, a game yep, or a video yep. when he pedals it. It's, so he's, like, behind you? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, we are, we're definitely exposing him to sport. Um, I want him to see what I'm doing. Um, and he, he enjoys it. It's super cute. Like, when I'm, like, when I'm done pedaling and, like, my wheel goes, and it's, like, slowing down, mm-hmm. you know, he claps for me. Like, he knows that's the end. Oh it's, like, God. super cute. Um, and Patrick always brings him out when I'm running to the track, and he gets to see that. And um, it, it's so cute because he'll he's over this phase, but a couple months ago when he was younger, he would, every cyclist was dada and every person that was running was mama. So like we'd be sitting there in the family room and he'd see somebody running and go running mama. And I'm like, Oh, that's not mama. But yeah. So I think it's Mm -hmm. like, we're definitely exposing him to sport. Um, And I, you know, I think if he sees we're enjoying it, he'll probably hopefully enjoy it too. Maybe Mm -hmm. not. Maybe he'll go the opposite route and be like, I want to do nothing that my Mm -hmm. parents do. But next question. New topic. Uh, what do you think of the trials course down in Atlanta? Yeah, so that's interesting. The the marathon trials are in Atlanta, super hilly, um, which isn't necessarily what the Olympics course is going to be like. But, you know, for me, I, I was actually thinking about this the other day and I have this really long answer that I'm not going to get into. But, like, I feel like I've I've always... Hills have always been bittersweet for me. Um, you know, I think for me, if I just go out and would run the course without training for it, I would be horrible. Um, and, and a lot of things, you know, I, I think back to my triathlon days when I'd run, I'd do these hill workouts and I was horrible when we started doing them the first weeks. And by the end of the weeks, I feel like I made the most improvement. I just feel like it's an uphill battle and I have all these metaphors going through my head of, you know, I can train for this course and I believe that I'll, I'll be, I'll be good on it. Um, but I kind of like that it's an uphill battle because I, this past quad, that's all I've been thinking about is this is an uphill battle. I want to get to the top of the mountain and I want to be successful. So I kind of like how it all plays into this metaphor I have going around in my head. 
It's also a very exciting time to be an American oh. female marathon yeah. runner in this golden age that we're experiencing right now. It's amazing. And I actually, I love it. I'm, I'm thriving off of it. I, I really believe success breeds success. And, you know, you, you see these women, you know, Shalane going out there winning uh, major marathons. I think it really showed all the other American women that I can do this. We can mm-hmm. do this. Like we can compete with the best in the world. We can be the best. And that's just something that's really exciting. And I think it's just allowed the sport to flourish. Yeah, there's so much momentum. Yeah. And the spotlight is on you guys right yeah. now. It's pretty cool. It's amazing. So as a pro athlete, you spend a lot of your time in the pain cave. When you're in the pain <laughs> cave, what are a couple of your mantras that you give yourself to keep Good going question. and get to the next step? Yeah, um, you know, I've never been a big like mantra person, but what I've I've learned in my in my triathlon days, for me, I've focused on saying things over and over that were techniques. So like when I'm running and it's getting painful, I just say like relax the shoulders or increase the cadence, something that will help my form, but distract my brain from the pain. Mm. But I find I perform best when I'm not thinking about that stuff and you're just so engaged in the race and like making moves and being aware and alert. Like that's, I think that mental state is what I 90% of the time am in. And that's when I'm performing the best is like when I'm not even, like you're going through so much pain, but you're just, you saw, I don't know how to describe it. It's just like, you're more focused and alert and aware. And you're just like, okay, what's the next move? Who's going to make that move? This person's there. How are they feeling? What are they doing? And just kind of like an out of body, like trying to sense what everyone else is doing, not what your own like body being is. fully present. Yes. The more present you In that are, moment, the less yep. there's that yep. chatter of yeah. wanting to quit. Yeah. Cool. Um, you said that triathlon chose you, but I'm I'm wondering what it's like to be the clear favorite in an Olympic race like in Rio, uh, knowing that there's this massive sort of story behind it. And when you crossed the line, it seemed like there was this massive, obviously like for most athletes, like a release of emotion. Um, was that to know that the story had sort of wrapped up the way you wanted, where I think a lot of us thought you would take this career and just sort of keep going and like if it hadn't ended like that you know you had these other plans. <laughs> yeah I think you know um that emotion in, in that race the Olympic race was such I didn't know that I was going to have so much relief um that was probably the biggest emotion I had which I wasn't planning for or thinking I was going to have um it was holy cow like I just put four years into one day and I somehow performed on that one day like what is the likelihood that you're going to feel good and perform well on on Mm. one day when you're preparing for four years for a one day event like it was just incredible but it is interesting because going into that race um I was the the most calm I've ever been it was a very unique situation like normally I get pretty nervous before races and and that one even though I was the favorite I just it was something where I felt like, you know what, I did all the work. Um, I'm prepared and whatever happens is gonna happen. So it was a very, that that race was just so unique in that way because I've never felt that way before. Did you have a sense when you crossed the finish line that you were done? <laughs> were you consciously aware that that would be your last race or did that come later? No, and you know, I actually, I, I competed in more triathlons that year. Um, it was actually like, I did the world championship that year. And that's like the only thing I regret ever doing is doing that race. Cause my heart just wasn't in it. Like mm. I was, I remember going to training and I was just so grumpy and it just didn't want to do it. And, um, it, it was really difficult. Mm. How do you celebrate? What does winning look like? Yeah. You know, I think, um, that's something I learned from Jamie Turner, my triathlon coach as well as like, celebrate like don't just move on don't I think a lot of times especially as an elite athlete you you finish a race and you look at all the negatives and I think you need you need to kind of do that you need to look at like where can I improve how can I get better but as well you just need to celebrate you don't know like as an athlete something could happen where it could put you out of the sport forever and I think you know those moments when you do have success and you've put in a ton of work and it's paid off, you need to celebrate. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's always going out to, to dinner with my team and 
they always have lots of beers and stuff. I don't normally. Sometimes I'd, I'll have a sip of my husband's or two. Um, but yeah, just going out to eat with them and really celebrating with them and enjoying their time. Mm-hmm. I think as an athlete, we don't. I'm really fortunate that my family travels a lot to, to races. My parents, my sister, uh, my in-laws. And as an athlete, you don't really get to... You miss a lot of weddings and family occasions. And, you know, you're not there for Christmas and all the holidays. And so, like, to be able to just spend time with them, that's the biggest celebration that, that I can have post-race. Mm. So I've been a fan of yours for a very long time. So I was... I watched your race in Rio, and then when you decided to transfer into just running and doing marathon, we actually ran Chicago Marathon. And oh, yeah. I saw you at the finish line after you had already run, and you were congratulating people, and I thought that was so cool. So I'm definitely rooting yeah. for you to win gold, for sure. <laughs> Do you foresee that you would have a similar feeling in the sense that you would want to change sports? Because you seem to be someone that is always looking for, like, the next challenge. <laughs> Modern pentathlon. And I think that's... <laughs> But I think that's really, really cool. So do you feel like that's just something that's in you that you always, that you don't want to do the same thing and do it twice. You'd rather do it once and be the best and then move on and find something new that you can improve on. It's so weird because I like, I like consistency and I actually really dislike change, but my, my major life decisions don't really show that. Uh, but I think for me, the reasons I, I, I change sport are a lot of times I've reached what I believe is my ceiling um, and it doesn't motivate me to, to do what I've already done. And, you know, so I don't know, like if I, if I'm successful in running, uh, I think I, I, right now I plan to run as long as I feel like I have more in me, more potential to reach. Mm. And as long as the love of it is still there. Mm. You know, most most of us will not be able to taste sort of the fraction of one percent athletes. So I was just curious if you had any nuggets for the everyday athlete. Yeah, I think not being afraid to surround yourself with people who are better than you. I think a lot of times, you know, we like to remain in this comfort zone of maybe being your best, or you don't want to. You know, maybe you find it humiliating if somebody beats you or, or whatever it is. And I just feel like being in a group environment where you have people to push you on a daily basis, to have people that are better than you, that's something that I find really encouraging. And it holds you accountable because you have to meet them at a certain time. So, um, you know, you're not going to skip a workout because you know that they're counting on you. And I also think, uh, you know, everyone brings something different to the table. And a day that you're doing well, you're able to uplift others. And a day when others are doing well, they're able to up lift you and it just makes everyone in the group be able to have more success. Mm. What is a day in the life look like? See, everyone thinks like being an athlete is super exciting. I don't, I think it's kind of just whatever it's, you know, I wake up and, um, do you want a typical running day or a typical, what I used to do in triathlon day? Uh, maybe like what it's like typical running day, but like non, non injured running day. (laughs) Well, because I think there's yeah, this yeah. idea like, oh, you just run a couple times a day and then you just go about your life or whatever. But your your attention to detail and all these other, you know, the PT areas yep. and all that, you know, the, with the nutrition, like all of that. It's like it's full on like from Wait, dawn I to mean, dusk. Yeah, I think sport's a unique thing and everything you do throughout the day affects your performance. So it's not like a nine to five. Like you can't ever, like I can't totally shut off like and you don't get weekends off like everything you do affects your performance resting what you put in your body what you're eating um so typical day you know in running i think what i underestimated when i switched sports was how uh much prehab is done and you know in in, in triathlon i used to be able to wake up and literally run from my door Mm -hmm. um and now there's no way i could wake up and just run i i have these exercises that i do to warm up the body for i normally wake up have breakfast, do some like warm up exercises at the house for like 15 minutes, um, go to Nike and do a couple more quick activation things to get my glutes firing, my abs firing. Is this because you're just, the run volume is so much higher that it requires that? Because the run volume is so much higher. So like to prevent injury um, and then, you know, just everything is the pounding you're putting on your body. You just need to make sure that every step you take is uh, the correct biomechanically. Otherwise you're you're just going to put yourself in this huge hole. And then, um, you know, as well in, in triathlon, um, if I'd roll out of bed and go for a run, 
I'd be going like nine minute pace. And now like these are quality runs when right. I wake up, like we need better really be ready are. to go and like actually uh, get a good workout out of it. So like just making sure the body's primed and, and ready. Um, so we do, I do some of those activation things to make sure everything's firing and ready to run. And then I'll run for in the morning, anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. Um, then do an hour strength session in the gym. And then I go home, have lunch, take a nap. And then I do a second run anywhere from 35 to 35 to an hour. Um, and then I have treatment I say every other day, but it's four or five times a week. So that's mm. more than every other day. Um, you know, it's I'm getting dry needling, I'm getting massage, uh, PT. So there's definitely a, a big portion of it is is keeping that body right. healthy. It's not just Netflix on the couch. No, and, and it, well, if, if it is on those or... like one or two days that I don't have a treatment, it's my husband uh -huh. working out stuff on my foot and my calves and yeah. Yeah. You just quoted time, and as somebody who knows a little bit about Bowerman, um, Jerry Miles are uh, more <laughs> about time and less about miles. Yep. Um, can you explain to everybody here a little bit about that, and has that changed anything for you as um, in your training? Yeah, so my husband always gets mad at me because I always tell him, he has like, how, long, how far did you run? And I tell him it in Jerry Miles. So Jerry Miles are, you get to count eight minutes as one mile, and we almost always run faster than that. So, um, you know, I'll be like, oh, I ran 120 miles this week. And Pat's like, well, how many actual miles, like GPS miles? And it's always way more than that. But um, that's Jerry Miles. Um, and, you know, it's it's something that I think is, it's done for a very unique, a, a good reason, you know, especially like if you go to altitude and you are fatigued, you don't want to have to worry. It's the, t it's the time on the feet that really fatigues that body. It, it's not the miles. So like at altitude, mm. you're probably be going slower and maybe you are going slower than eight minute miles, but it's that time on the feet that we want to count because that's what can, you know, lead to injury and, and that major fatigue, I guess. Mm. Interesting. But I think counting miles, I've actually really enjoyed it. It's, Something when I switched to, so when I was running in college, everything was in miles. And then I switched to triathlon and everything was in kilometers. So I've actually really enjoyed this because every time I've started a new sport, I feel like I've had nothing to compare because uh -huh. I just switch um, times. Now and I think it's Jerry's. Exactly. And yeah. you just, I think it's smart. You know, Jamie, my triathlon coach, told me it's not about the outcome and it's not about what that mile split is. And it just, it's about focusing on, are you doing everything correct on a daily basis? And if you are focusing on that technique and that process, that's what's going to lead to the success. Not every mile was 7.05 today or mm. some, it's not some magic outcome number that's going to lead to success. I think in swimming, I think that was, when I switched to triathlon, that was actually really difficult for me mentally to overcome because in swimming, everything is so time-based. It's things are on time cycles, like send-offs and I remember my Jamie would not give us send-offs he would just say go do you know eight two hundreds at threshold and I'd be like okay what's the send-off it's like that's you got to decide that and I'm mm. just like deer in a head like like it took me a long time he's like whatever it needs yeah, but you to get be. to make the decision for yourself <laughs> you should like this um in in training I I yeah. like somebody else to tell me what to do I think mm. you know I'm I've definitely learned like as an athlete if I don't have a, a coach I'd say they're holding me back in a good way, um, not in a negative way. Like if I coach myself, I would always think like more is better, more is better, more is better. And I, I think that's a, a bad mentality to get into. I think it's really good to see the bigger picture, to see that you need recovery days, mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, all right, we got to round this out. I thought a, a great way to kind of end it would be if Patrick could come up here. Oh, you mind coming in here for a second? And I can exit the seat. <laughs> yeah, he gets not the hot so seat. fast. Oh. No, but I want to <laughs> ask him one question, um, which is, uh, you know, look as as you know, very much um, Gwen's partner and right hand person in in you know in life and career and sport and everything. What is what it, you know? What do you think is something that the public doesn't quite grasp or understand about who this incredible athlete is? You know, I think one one thing that Gwen has a great ability to do is is to motivate and inspire those around her. There's a ton of service providers that 
that come in and have their fingerprints on Gwen, you know, whether they're a massage therapist, a Cairo, whoever. And I think uh, going back to Gwen making those goals very public, that uh, that turns into holding them accountable. Mm-hmm. And I think um, I think that that's been one big thing. The other one is I think Gwen is a very curious person, and once she th- has her eyes set on something that could make her performance a lot better, she asks a ton of questions and wants to just grab as much information mm-hmm. from that person as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds like that goes back to the ownership thing, right? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, Pat's saying that, and I think something that we've been not afraid to do is is push limits and, and push boundaries with sponsors. And, you know, I've, I've had... Uh, there was one sponsor in, in my triathlon days where I, I, I was offered maybe like five times the amount of money for a different sponsor in the same category. It, it was ridiculous. Or this other company who was offering me less money but willing to innovate and make a product that I believed would make me a better athlete. And that's something that I've always been really passionate about is like, I am, I guess, I, I never would call myself curious, but I am like, I'm curious as to like, how can we make this sport better? How can we improve? Mm. Where, where have people, what have they not thought about that we can do? And I think that, you know, it leads back to the, like bringing four bikes to Rio and you don't need to, um, you know, and eight swimsuits and you we'd show up at the airport and people are just like, what in the world? Yeah. Like we had thousands of bags. It was <laughs> ridiculous. So yeah, it is like, being curious and, and pushing the limits and seeing what can we do to to be the best athlete. Is there something that somebody else is forgetting about that mm-hmm. we can get an edge on? And, you know, I think, you know, switching over to, um, to running, it was, yeah, I, I knew, like, this is going to be a huge challenge. I've never run this much in my life. I don't, I haven't been running for years. Like, I didn't run you know, I didn't even run fully in college and, you know, I don't have those running mileage, but I knew that I could bring other areas. Like there are, to my knowledge, nobody like Patrick out there where somebody is like fully supporting the athlete and yeah. like doing all the grocery shopping, doing all the cooking, like carrying the bags, like every, whatever it is to make my life easier so that I can perform. And I'm like, you know, we've figured out what it takes on all the logistics and we know what it takes on the mental side. And so I'm like, you know, I, I have a few boxes that I can take over from triathlon that will um, help me overcome that, that battle that I have in coming, competing against women who have been running their entire life. Yeah. The team uh, aspect of everything you're doing is like huge. Oh yeah. There's so many moving pieces in this. And, and Patrick, you really, it, you know, by all accounts, you're the one who's driving this whole thing. <laughs> I so mean, I always say like I n- would never win, never would have won triathlon yeah. without him. And I definitely wouldn't, I mean, I never would have had the courage to to go abroad. I, I was very introverted. I still am like home body person. And um, Patrick and my team around me allowed me to push my limits in what I thought I was capable of, I guess. Yeah. All right. I think that's a good place to end it. So 210 some odd days, Olympic (laughs) trials. Uh, All of us will be tuning in eagerly to cheer you on and um, excited for you. It's really cool, it's inspiring. And uh, I appreciate you sharing with everybody today. Thank you. Both of you guys, like can't wait to see what you're gonna do. Cool. Thanks. All right, thank you guys. Inspiring that Gwen Jorgensen, isn't she? I really enjoyed that. I hope you guys did too. Good stuff. For more on the world of Gwen Jorgensen, please visit the show notes on the episode page at richroll.com. There you can extend your experience of this incredible human being uh, with tons of links and resources to go beyond the earbuds. And please let her know directly how you felt about today's conversation by sharing your thoughts with her on Twitter or Instagram at Gwen Jorgensen. And uh, don't forget to check out her YouTube channel as well. It's pretty cool. It's just YouTube, Gwen Jorgensen, Google it. You'll find it. Links in the show notes as well. If you'd like to support our work here on the podcast, just tell your friends about the show or your favorite episode. Uh, Share the show on social media. Take a screen grab or how about just in person letting your friend know over lunch that you're enjoying the show. That would be cool. Uh, Subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on YouTube, on Google Podcasts. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. 
And you can support us on Patreon at richroll.com forward slash donate. One afterthought that I just had, uh, Apple Podcasts just announced new categories for podcasts. And we historically have been under the health category and the subcategory of fitness and nutrition. Now we are under the category of education and self-improvement being the subcategory. So if you've had difficulty tracking it down on that platform, that's where we're now located. And that's also where you can uh, direct other people to find our show. I want to thank everybody who helped put on the show today. Jason Camiolo for audio engineering production, show notes, interstitial music. Blake Curtis and Margot Lubin generally video this podcast, but this is an audio only one. But I do want to thank them as well because they're hard at work on all these other videos. And Blake right now is sitting on the other side of this window handling audio engineering. So what's up, Blake? Jessica Miranda for graphics, DK for advertiser relationships, uh, portraits generally by Allie Rogers, but not this week. Um, these portraits were taken by Talbot Cox, the ones of uh, Gwen that you'll see there. So thank you, Talbot. And theme music as always by Anna Lemma. Appreciate you guys. Thank you for the love. See you back here in another couple of days with the natural lifestylist, Tony Riddle. It's a good one. We made a cool video for that one too. Some uh, barefoot running tutorial type stuff, kind of vloggy. It's very cool. You're going to dig it. So until then, be well. Peace, plants, namaste. Oh, 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 oh,